we measure as z and then we go through a second Stenker lack and measure s x uh, the two resulting beams are redirected to a common trajectory and introduced into a third Stenker lack oriented on the z axis i will draw it in a minute so everything will be much clearer finally we have a detector screen and we want to see what we will be detected first if we filter the atoms with positive sx let's try to draw it um ah, yeah. A ver. Yeah, pero bueno, ya, ya lo recordaremos. I don't care. Well, so we have the beams that go out the chamber, the SZ measurer. Uh, well, let's assume that this is the negative value, and this is this is the beta states, and these are the alpha states. These are eigenstates of S Z. Then we take this, and we make them go through an S X measure. And this is the X axis. This is the Z axis. And here we can separate the s, the plus and the minus, the states with positive and negative component of s x. Hmm? This is an x. And uh, now we take these states and we make them go again through an s z measurer. Hmm? So in principle, what happens? if we have here a detector screen. First case was uh, was just what I have drawn here. And uh, since the eigenstates of Sx were, let's uh, put uh, uh, the plus states are one normalization constant times the alpha plus the beta then when these atoms go through an SZ measure we have 50% of obtaining positive and negative value so the beam should split into beams the alpha and the beta or the beta and the alpha that depends on the direction of the field mm -hmm. so the first case is um, uh, is clear <laughs> no ah no <laughs> you are right uh, let me see no i have to raise well i i'm not sure of the order of the questions but I think I remember more or less. Hmm? Another possibility. What happens if we make them, the second beam is redirected to make it convergent with the first beam. But every atom is being registered. I mean that this device uh, takes into account for each atom which is the value of Sx. So we have some detector here and here that tell us for every atom which is the component of Sx. That means that we are really collapsing the state in this eigenstate or this eigenstate. And so no matter if the atom has a plus or a minus sign of Z, they will always here split into beams. 
because this eigenstate is also a combination with equal probabilities of the alpha and the beta states. The only thing that changes is the sign, but the probabilities, which are the square of the coefficients, are the same. So, in both cases, we obtain here two beams in the detector screen. But, finally, we consider a case in which we have no register of the state of every atom when passes across the SX measurer. So, the beams are separated, but we have a complete vacuum between this and this, and so we have no way of knowing for each individual atom which is the value of Sx. In this case, although the, the system is completely the same, the difference, well, it's not the same because here we have not, no register, no uh, signal that allow us to say which is the value of Sx. So, in this case, when we made the two beams go together here, well, we, no, let me, ah. uh, como se borda aquí. Ah, sí, es verdad, sí. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, never mind. No, all the atoms go through the lower path, and we have no possibility of obtaining beta in the measure in the device that measures S Z. Okay? Uh, because in fact, the two the the spin state all the times is this, no, is uh, this spin state. Yeah? There has been no collapse leading to the plus or the minus state. It's uh, really surprising, but that's what is obtained. Yeah? If we have no way, no register of the result of a measurement device, this is not a measurement device. Uh, we will discuss this in the talks at the end of my classes because the consequences of this are really surprising. Yeah? Uh, we will reach the, the conclusions that can be drawn from this are amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this let, have let, let us to go deeper into the idea of measuring. Yeah? Measuring means having the possibility, at least in principle, of knowing a property. Maybe uh, the, the is, there is not the necessity of a human being to look at the result, but if we have some register that could, in principle, be checked, we have make a measurement. If we have not that kind of register, we have not make a measurement, and then there, there, there is not a collapse. Of course, here, the particles that go through one way or through the other have a different spatial part. Hmm? The spin part is always the alpha state, but they have a different path. But we have no register of the path, then we have no way of knowing the spin. Okay, so let's... Um, Let's go to the next slide. Well, let's go to the fifth postulate that deals with the evolution of a quantum system while we are not measuring. That's the free evolution. A system prepared in a pure state remains in a pure state while, while no measurements are made on it. On, on it. A vector representing the state of the system evolves during time according to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation 
which is, as you already know, this one. Mm -hmm. The Hamiltonian could be a function of time, mm -hmm. as, as is when we have a system that interacts, for instance, with light, with electromagnetic radiation, then we have in the potential energy, we have a term that oscillates with time. Even for those cases, the equation applies and let us know the evolution of the vector representing a pure state. Um, well, we need to know how do the expected value evolve, because we have already said that everything that can be predicted by theory are expected values. So the time derivative of an expected value in any state can be taken by taking the derivative of the three terms, yeah, by, by expanding the derivative of the products. We can take first the product of the ket, of the bra times the, the ket, and then to, to, de to decompose into the products of the operator and the state. And we can formally take the derivatives as with normal functions, and then for instance, if we, uh, okay, uh, I uh, h bar times the derivative, we can apply the Rengar equation. This is the Hamiltonian applied to uh, the vector state. And here we have the same thing. But, well, in fact, um, in one case, <coughs> let's see. Okay, in this case, in order to take this to the right hand side, we have to take to, since this is, well, this is in fact 1 over i h Hamiltonian applied to the state vector, and then uh, this can be put in the right-hand side by taking the conjugate, and so uh, at the end, well, in fact, it is uh, Hermitian or self-adjoint, so the conjugate in this case makes nothing. The question is, at the end, you reach two terms with H, A, and with A, and here you also find H. Yeah? And uh, in one of them, the I, when goes out, has to be conjugated, so you have to change the sign, and at the end you find that you obtain the expected value of the commutator. Mm -hmm. So this is the way of obtaining the expected value the evolution, the time evolution of the expected value for any observable. Some observables have the property that are constant in any state of the system and are called constants of motion. And it's evident that if this has to be zero for any state vector, in fact, this operator plus this operator must be zero. Eh? The only way that every expected value of an operator is zero is that the operator itself is zero. So this is the mathematical condition that must fulfill any constant of motion. In most cases, operators are independent on time. Mm -hmm. The only case of time-dependent operators that we will find is precisely the Hamiltonian of a non-isolated system, of a system that is interacting with an oscillating field. Except for that case, we will always find operators whose expression does not contain the time, and so in those cases, a constant of motion fulfills that commutes with the Hamiltonian. Okay. <clears throat> well, 
it's uh, for practical reasons it's very convenient to describe the evolution of a pure state also we will see that can be used for mixed states in terms of a time evolution operator the definition of the time evolution operator is very simple is an operator that given the state vector at some time t0 produce the operator at some later time t and so in fact to 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 obtain the time evolution operator is equivalent to solve the time dependent Rengel equation which is the equation that defines the that allows to obtain the time evolution operator it is this one eh? which is readily verified by applying this to psi t0 and to psi t0 then you obtain exactly the time dependent Schrodinger equation eh? this is psi sometime t this is y no. this is psi at t mm -hmm. the in the particular case of a time independent hamiltonian it is rather straightforward to see that the time evolution operator can be is a function of the hamiltonian a, a very simple function of the hamiltonian mm -hmm. well this can be checked by putting this expression into this equation and formally taking the derivative as if we were working with functions not with operators uh, formally let me okay if we put this <coughs> here we have to take the derivative but the derivative of an exponential is the same exponential times the derivative of the exponent with respect to t and formally this derivative can be written as minus i uh, t Oh, no, the battery is. Oh, sorry. Uh, minus i divided, no, minus i uh, h bar divided h, uh, h operator divided by h bar. Mm -hmm. Then we multiply by i h and uh, i times i minus one times minus plus one so this is h so effectively this is a solution of the equation well in fact the demonstration is not so straightforward because when we derive a function an exponential function the derivative can be written on the left hand side or on the right hand side why can i i read i have written um, the derivative in the first hand side uh, in the left side because because i know that this has to be that way in order to obtain the result <laughs> but uh, the more rigorous demonstration can be found here eh? to take a derivative of an exponential is similar as taking the derivative of functions but you can take care with the order yeah? and in this case it can be verified that this result is correct yeah? well for this case time independent hamiltonian we have a particularly simple type of states which are stationary states which are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Hmm. Let's assume that we have at time t0 
an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian with eigenvalue AK. What is the time evolution of this state? Well, let's apply the time evolution operator to this state. But this operator is a function of the Hamiltonian. And we have seen that a function of an operator has the same eigenstates. In fact, the, the spectral decomposition of the function is the same as the spectral decomposition of the variable, of h in this case, except for substituting, substituting the eigenvalues by the function of the corresponding eigenvalues. So h and u, in this case, function of h, have the same eigenvectors and every eigenvalue of u is the exponential of the corresponding eigenvalue of h. So if this is an eigenvalue of h with an eigenstate of h with this eigenvalue, this is also an eigenstate of u with this eigenvalue. So, in this way, to write uh, to write the the effect of applying the time evolution operator to a stationary state is straightforward. The result is that the state vector evolves in time by the multiplication with a complex number of modulus one. This, this time-dependent term disappears whenever we calculate uh, any expected value. Yeah? Because if we calculate the expected value, the expected value, say, well, in the state, well, let me... If we calculate some expected value at some time t of a given operator A, and uh, we use this expression, exponential of tal, 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 psi t0, A, exponential of tal tal psi t0. Well, this exponential can be, this is a complex number that can be put outside the scalar product. And this is a complex number that can be put outside, but since it is in the first uh, member, we have to take the complex conjugate. So we are led to e to minus tal tal, e to plus tal tal, and the expected value at time t0. And so the expected value is independent on time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are some similarities with, with, uh, between these and what we have uh, said about uh, constants of motion, but it has nothing to do. Hmm? A constant of motion is an observable that is constant for every state of the system, and a stationary state is a particular type of states of systems with time-independent Hamiltonian in which no property evolves with time, no matter if this is a constant of motion or not. Hmm? Uh, the first thing was a property of the observable. This is a property of the state. And this can be only defined for 
systems with time independent Hamiltonian. Well, of course, if the Hamiltonian is time independent, we also can have non stationary states. That means states with, at a given time, are non eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. For instance, any linear combination of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with different uh, eigenvalues, with different energies, is, according to the first theorem, is no longer an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian and thus is no longer uh, stationary, uh, well, is not a stationary state, does not represent a stationary state. How is the evolution of non-stationary states? Well, if we have the non-stationary state expressed in the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, the evolution is very, very simple. We apply the time evolution operator to the initial state vector. And then, since the operator is linear, we can apply it across the sum and the C and apply it directly to the to all of the individual uh, base vectors, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, and then we already know that the effect of applying to those vectors the time evolution operator is this one. Yeah? So the evolution of a non-stationary state, if we have it expressed that way is trivial. The only thing is that here, in every term, we have to add this exponential, the exponential of minus i time energy divided by k. Yeah? And the energy is the one, the eigenvalue, corresponding to the state that we have here. Hmm? Let's see an example. Let's consider a hydrogen atom that in the initial state is given by this state vector. Hmm? What will be the state in a later time if there has been a free evolution, if there are not no measurements, no interactions with other systems during that time? The only thing we have to do is to include this exponential here and this exponential here. And that's the, the state vector at any time. Mm -hmm. uh, in this particular case, since the energy of the ground state in atomic units is minus one half, and the energy of the first excited state is minus one over A, in atomic units, we can put explicitly the value of the coefficients for the stationary state in terms of time. Mm -hmm. um, well, I leave you to check that if you take the expected value of any observable for this state, this is, in this is, in general, a function of time. Yeah? Uh, and the same happens with any, of course, any probability or probability density, since all of them can be put it as expected values. Yeah? So the properties of a stationary state, stationary, non-stationary states, evolve in general with time, with some exception, some exceptions that are the observables that are constant of motion. For instance, in a, in a time independent system, in a system with a time independent Hamiltonian, it is clear that this is zero. And so any observable whose operators commute with Hamiltonian is a constant of motion. For instance, total energy. Total energy of any system with a 
time independent Hamiltonian must be constant in time in every state, no matter if this is an eigenstate or not. If it's an eigenstate, the constant value will be the, the eigenvalue. If it is not a constant state, we have to take uh, not a stationary state, we have to take the average, the, the expected value, but this expected value will be constant in time for the Hamiltonian as well as for any other constant of motion. Time evolution operators are always unitary. That means that the inverse coincides with the adjoint. Self-adjoint or Hermitian was an operator who's, that coincides with its adjoint. Unitary means that it coincides with the in, the adjoint coincides with the inverse. This is rather trivial for time-independent Hamiltonians because we have an explicit expression, but in the general case, it's not so evident, but it can be demonstrated. This implies, for instance, that scalar products are preserved in the evolution in time. If we have a state vector that is normalized, after some time, it is again normalized. This is trivially seen by putting the, the vector at time t in terms of the initial vector and then taking this to the first part of the scalar product. Since we have to take the conjugate, because it's not an Hermitian operator, here we obtain the conjugate, the, no, not the conjugate, the adjoint times u. That means the inverse times u, that is the unity operator. And so the scalar products are preserved. Mm -hmm. In general, uh, okay, yeah, that, that's right. Well, just a comment, uh, at least for me, I have a very bad memory. And uh, it's uh, useful to think of this parallelism that exists between complex numbers that are more familiar for me and linear operators. For instance, a complex number is real if it coincides with its, with its uh, conjugate. The equivalent to real numbers are Hermitian operators or self-adjoint operators. And also, they coincide with there, in this case, instead of conjugate, we have to say they're adjoint. Mm -hmm. any, uh, any, for any alpha real, um, the exponential of i alpha is a number, a complex number of modulus one. Okay? And uh, it fulfills that the adjoint coincide, not the the conjugate coincides with the number because to take the conjugate is to change the sign, the sign of i. That means conjugate is equivalent to inverse, and then uh, the inverse and the conjugate coincide. So. The equivalent with operators, the equivalent of complex number of modulus one are unitary operators. And unitary operators also fulfill that the inverse coincides with the adjoint. Here, the inverse coincides with the complex conjugate. Mm -hmm. um, well, and uh, uh, in complex number, complex numbers of modulus one are normally called phases, and here are unitary operators. And finally, if we want to take some operator from the right-hand side of a scalar product to the left-hand side, we have to add the, the dagger, the, the adjoint sign, and if we want to take a number, a complex number, from one side to the other, we have to take the conjugate. Okay? So there is... Uh, uh, parallelism that can be useful to remember 
properties of unitary and, and Lipian operators. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's uh, finish. Let me. Okay, let's let it here. If you have uh, any question, and uh, of course, if you have uh, questions that appear after after listening or after thinking about it, you can you can send me uh, a mail, eh, and we can. I don't know. Maybe I. You have not my my email. I put it here just in case. Um, let me see. G. Paniagua. Okay. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much and see you on Tuesday.